And do we have any readers or? No, you can have a start if you're lucky. Okay, let's see. So this is chapter seven. The seven planes or haft samawat. Haft must be seven samawat. I wonder what that literally means. Mm -hmm. I don't know that word. Huh. I tried to find Arabic, online Arabic dictionaries this morning. Uh -huh. It was exceedingly frustrating. Mm -hmm. They kept saying, we are going to be creating the outstanding worldwide online Arabic English dictionary. Mm -hmm. But they didn't have the damn thing. Uh -huh. Or else where they did, then when I clicked on it, it gave Google, Bing, uh -huh. and 20 other things. Yeah. So, what if it's on Duolingo? Uh -huh. You know, huh? you know Duolingo? Oh, it's wonderful to learn any language. There's none in the library? They got yeah. Turkish or English. The problem with an it's Arab, an if I have a word for an Arabic, Arabic, I have to Arabic. know how to read, read the Arabic alphabet. Yeah, I can't. Do they do the um, um, <coughs> angles? Do they use the 26 letter alphabet to, to you give you an idea of what the word says? I'm learning Italian. Well, I didn't Two, find any dictionary that even got Two. to that point. Two. Two. I know, I appreciate it if they do it in the original alphabet, if then they so put it in it. Roman alphabet. Well. Yeah. Yeah. Some dictionaries yeah. do that. What's the terminology when you it, yeah. turn something oh, into our alphabet? Some... Transliteration. Transliteration into the Roman <laughs> alphabet, yeah. Okay. okay. Well, I guess pencil, I, I don't know, is that Duncan? Probably is. Each spiritual plane may be likened to a city presenting characteristic features. Is there words above presenting? Yeah, I can't quite read it. That's something certain. Something that has certain characteristic features, objective words, and subjective. Right? Now... That has certain... Yeah, certain characteristics. That features. Good. Yeah. Yeah, that's Objective and subjective. Now, for the purposes of illustration, the objective phenomena of a particular city may be said to consist of the railway station, the waiting room, the restroom, and rest house, and notable sites. And now, I'm not familiar with this, but from having read this last week, I guess there, there's, they would have a, a rest house which is outside the station. Have any of you seen this kind of thing? So there's a waiting room in the station. Well, there. I guess they mean a rest room, like, you know, the, the ladies' toilets are called rest rooms. No, no, it's not that. Yeah. It'd be kind of a place you could sleep. and. Oh. Yeah. So I yeah. guess they would have that facility with these old British system, I yeah. suppose. So there'd be a rest house associated with the station. So that's the objective. These are the features that are there. The subjective phenomenon, whatever it is, are the impressions and reactions on the consciousness of the traveler who visits the city. And crossed out, such as office, authority, makami, haira, abode of enchantment, fana, and baka. So he crosses all of that out, that those things are apparently part of the subjective response of the person in the pilgrims in the planes. The particular plane arrived at by the pilgrim is comparable to a railway station where the train halts for some time. And the state of consciousness, how, yeah, this is a basic Sufi term. You're, a hal is a state that is revealed to you at a new place in the path. The state of consciousness hal is akin to the movements of passengers after alighting on the station, or mukam. These are big Sufi terms, hal and mukam. Hal is the state that gets revealed to you, and mukam is the station that you're at. The traveler on alighting on the station usually goes from the waiting room to the rest house in the city. In very rare cases, one is stranded or stuck in the waiting room only. And when this occurs, 
the station in the waiting room induce the traveler into the state of consciousness known to the Sufis as mukam i hairat Now, Baba uses this um, on the, the uh, third plane, between the third plane and the fourth plane. Um, if you get caught in a state of enchantment, that's a hairat. Muhammad the Must was in that, he got stuck there. And sometimes you'll be stuck in a certain position for weeks or years together and not move. So he's using the analogy of a waiting room for that. After entering a new plane of consciousness, a person usually takes some time before he can freely function on that plane. As there is a radical change in the total conditions of mental life, the person experiences a sort of paralysis of mental activity, which is known as samadhi or istigrag, rak, istigrak, of the Sufis. You've heard of samadhi, right? Mm. Yeah. yeah. When the pilgrim enters a new plane, he merges into that plane before he can experience the state which is characteristic of that plane. So, he put a line through all of that, has he? No. No. Oh, I thought that. Oh, there is a bit of a sort line. Of, line goes right through. Yeah, I think Duncan later on oh, says right. that There's he, a line, he yeah. sort of thinks the whole analogy is confusing and should be cut out. Whereas I like it myself. It's mm. the first time I've ever had any idea what these things mean. Mm. Just as a pilgrim who is tired by the strain of the journey sometimes goes to sleep, consciousness, which has made the effort of ascending to a new plane, goes through a period of lowered mental activity comparable to sleep. But at the same time, the samadhi is fundamentally different from sleep because in sleep a person is totally unconscious. Whereas in samadhi, he is. Let's see, I guess we get another page out of this. Conscious of bliss or light or power, although he is unconscious of his body or the surroundings. After a period of comparative stillness, the mind begins to function on the new plane and experiences a new state of consciousness, which is utterly different from the state which it has left behind. You know, that's new, all of this is news to me. So I guess when you go onto a new plane, you're kind of oh. in a dazed state for a while. It sort of makes sense, because you're at a, at a level here, and when you moved up to another level, it's sort of, you, it saps that energy that you've had, yeah. mm -hmm. and you've got to re sort of recoup. Yeah. Haven't you? To get the other energy back in to be able to move forward again. Yeah. yeah sounds like you know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> it only sounds like it. I'm trying to remember, remember some of those lower planes where all this happened. <laughs> yeah. You can even relate to it here, can't you, when you get shock or... Yeah. Um, Something like that. Some mornings just like that. <laughs> That's right, you wake up and you're stunned. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I had an experience once where I was on my motorbike and this van turned across in front of me and all I could see was grey. And like, my estimation was I was dead, that was, de that, that was it. And when I pulled up the bike on the other side, it was like, and it's like a total disbelief, you know, it's like, it takes a while for the brain to realise that you're still here. Yeah. You know? And then of course, once you realise that, then the, then the anger sets in and you've got to go. Punch the guy in the nose. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I did catch him and it was, an, it was an 80 year old guy, he must have been 80, and he had Coke bottle bottom glasses. <laughs> so obviously he didn't see me, right? But um, I did give him a bit of a tongue lap and poor, poor bloke. You know? Anyhow, that's all in the past. 
So I guess if you bother somebody who's just gone into a new plane of consciousness, they might give you a punch in the nose. <laughs> well, the, the woman saw what was happening. She came across and she said, why don't you leave the poor fellow alone? And, oh. and my, my response was, leave him alone? He almost killed me. Yeah. Mm. And that was sort of, that actually was a punch away. And that was the end of it. Like it, the energy had dissipated by then and I just sort of rode off. Mm. But it's an experience that's always registered there and I sort of have a look at it every so often, you know, okay, these things will happen. Generally, the traveller goes from the waiting room at the station to the rest house. I guess he's talking about sort of travelling practices that were common back then. Yeah, yeah. Or the, you know, from the waiting yeah. room in India. Into, into yeah. town to the yeah, motel. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, like a motel, yeah. But they had one that was associated. You get to see all the sights of the city on the way. Mm. Yeah, that's what he says here. Which the Sufis would call the Manzil. So the Manzil is the rest house associated with the plane. The pilgrims, as a matter of course, the pilgrim, as a matter of course, first rests in the Manzil before venturing out for sightseeing. And usually, after sightseeing, he sleeps in the rest house, Manzil. This sleep of the pilgrim in the Manzil may be said to represent fana of the Sufis for that particular plane. Now, does he mean literally when they go to sleep, or is it just a quiescence yeah. in the plane? I can't remember. <laughs> the God speaks is utterly ambiguous on this point. But you can't remember with that far back yet. Yeah. You know, when you get up on the sixth plane, everything just all blurs together. Mm. It might tell you a little bit further on. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Well, unfortunately, after this page, um, the rest of this is missing, unfortunately. It's too bad. Mm. So it's, it jumps, it, it got lost. The sleep of the pilgrim in the months only be said during the fun of the plane. Ninety-nine percent of the pilgrims wake up very soon from their sleep. And while in the awake state, they very naturally see the sights and scenery outside the rest house, as if through a window. This enjoyment of the panorama outside, through the window, with its sights and smells, from his comfortable stand or position in the manzil is for the pilgrim the state of baka as the sufis would call it and duncan asks makam but i think it really is baka can you say what um fana baka is again i just forget whatever yeah fana is a, um, an annihilation and baka is an abiding in. Ah, yes, that's right. So what God speaks, God speaks is completely unclear on this, but uh, mm. there's a lot on it in God speaks. But it, 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 when you go into a new plane, it says there's a fana. And when you abide in the plane, there's a baka of the plane. And the final fana is when your ego is annihilated. And the baka that follows that is when you come back to a consciousness of creation. So that's Baka Bila. Fana Fila is um, mm -hmm. annihilation, and Baka Bila is creation consciousness coming back to you. But this is the Fana and Baka of the plains. So he's Baka, he says, it's like you're in a rest station, and you wake up and look out the windows and see everything around you. I guess he doesn't go on to this, but I guess that would be different from actually going outside and getting lost in the yeah. marketplaces, yeah. which is what yeah. the must do. So it's, yeah. you've got some little thing between where you've been yeah. and where you are now. Like a you safe place. Yeah. You don't mingle. Yeah. It's probably a pretty intoxicating scenery too. It probably is. Yeah. And maybe it's very tempting to go outside too. I, I don't know. I would like to know if this analogy was given by Baba or if uh, mm -hmm. Gandhi. I find it interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because uh, uh, Duncan really criticizes it. Mm -hmm. But for me, it's the first time I've ever had any real idea what, what he's talking mm -hmm. about. Yeah. 
The one percent of the pilgrims who do not wake up from sleep in the manzil can be said to remain in fana till such time as they leave the body. Such a pilgrim, when he so I guess there are some people who just starts in that <coughs> stupor for the rest of their lives. Such a pilgrim, when he takes another form, rebirth, finds himself on the same station again. Accepting the baka of the seventh plane, every pilgrim, as a rule, stays for a very short period in the baka of the plains, one to six, and he soon goes out of the rest house for sightseeing. Okay, so that's not baka, that's actually sightseeing. 99% of the sightseers return to the manzil. The 1% who do not return from the sightseeing are known to the Sufis as Gum Shudagan, or the lost ones. Huh. So there are some who go to sleep and don't wake up. And there are some who wake up, go out, and don't come back again. Mm. I didn't know any of this. Hmm. So that had to be two different states, really. Sounds like it. Hmm. I'm gum, gum shot a shot a gun. I mean, is that a must? Is that what a must is? So you think they might be must? The gum shot a gun would well, be must. That occurs to me. Yeah, that occurs to me. Because they, you know, they're they're sort of lost. Mm. It would make sense that they get out there and don't come back to the rest house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is such types of gum shudagan who, because of their dazed condition of mind, and that sounds like a must, are mistakenly looked upon by the common run of mankind as real saints. And the Sufi poet Hafiz warns the worldly people against being taken in by such lost ones. Mm. And there the discourse breaks off and they yeah. seem to have the rest of it. Well, that doesn't sound like a must, though, does it? I don't know. I don't know. There could be must to the lower plains. I don't know. Uh, yeah. If they're lost in, in the sites, that would be sort of an intoxication, wouldn't it? Yeah. What is the next one you got? How much is missing in between? Well, it's handwritten, page three. And there are, many, there are lots of other drafts of this. I haven't studied them thoroughly, but I didn't, going through it quickly, see a follow-up to that. So, anyway, I think that's quite interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. It's the first time I've ever had a concrete image for all mm. this given. Okay, now we have hal and makam, and these are really big Sufi terms. I would have gotten into them had we had enough this morning, as a matter of fact, next week we might do it. Anybody else want to read or ask a If you can, and I have a piece of paper. Hal and makam. Here it is, uh, it is pertinent to discuss hal, state, and makam, stage in the light of Sufi Gnosis. Uh, with some Sufis, there is no appreciable difference between Hal and Makam. They maintain that every Makam is Hal at the beginning uh, and develops into Makam at the end. And, and this uh, uh, appears, is it? Applies. Appe applies to all the planes in included in the subtle and mental spheres. Many, however, distinguish Hal from the Khan. According to Abdullah uh, Harris, uh, uh, Mirabai, or something? Muha no, yeah. Sibi? Of Basra. Oh, it sounds like Rabi or um, Basra. No. Um, Hal is, uh, is, is secured. secured by practice. Mujahida. Mujahida. Uh, Makam is secured by the constant overshadowing of Hal. Hal is the gift of God. Uh, it, it is as fleeting as light, lightning. Makam is the result of uh, repentance. Uh, the author of, uh, 
a waffle, Marif, uh, has it thus. Hal signifies a hidden event that descends from the upper world upon the, uh, the, the heart of the pilgrim and keeps going and coming uh, with divine attraction uh, until the, the divine attraction draws him from the lowest to the highest stage. The come is the station on the path which the pilgrim arrives at. Uh, it becomes the place of, of his stay until uh, he advances further. Hal is, is not under the control of the pilgrim, uh, he is controlled by it. Mukam is in the traveller's sway. Hal is a gift, a um, mahod. Mukam is an acquisition, because Hal can never be uh, without being related to Mukam. Mukam can never be without being related to Hal. This is all in God Speaks in the supplement. Mm. Ivy took this and put it in. Whose handwriting is this, do you think? I have the idea it's Ghani's. Right. It totally writes sure. beautifully, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, Sheikh Muhammad uh, Ibrahim, also known as Guru uh, Ilaki, in his Samikarela Ishidi Ad says, uh, when Hal continues, it becomes become. Uh, whoever gets Hal once, it, uh, it, it once is a beginner and, 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 causes, and comes to be known as a Wali, and whoever continues in it becomes an adept. Maya Baba explains that Hal is the state of divine ecstasy and is, uh, all, and, and is always experienced in degrees of potency according to its related Mukum. Hal in Vedanta is called Bhav. Mukam is... So this is from Bhav, huh? Hmm. Yeah. Um, Mukam um, is the staging of the pilgrim uh, on a given plane. It's the stain of yeah. the pilgrim on a given plane. Uh, in, the, in that particular Hal, Hal and Mukam go together up to and, uh, and on the Sixth plane, uh, Hal always dominates Mukam. Hal and Mukam do not exist on the seventh plane. One experiencing the seventh plane becomes Hal itself. Where is Hal, there is duality. Uh, when one from the seventh plane comes down to normal consciousness and, and establishes himself on any plane, uh, for the sake of duty, then that particular plane becomes the Makam. Thus, for the Kuta, Sadhguru, there is no Hal, there is only Makam. Ordinary men, uh, who are by nature emotional, uh, get extraordinary, uh, get ordinary Hal, very, uh, uh, very often hearing music. This is pseudo Hal, which is not the which is not to be compared with spiritual hull of a pilgrim on the path. I can sort of understand those two ideas. Do you guys get them? No. <laughs> it would take a while to um, ten read readings on that. Hull well, is kind of like a state that suddenly overcomes you. Hmm. It's a gift. Yeah, it's a gift. It's hmm. given. You can't acquire it. But when you abide in it, it becomes your place, and then that's a makam. But in the beginning, it said that the makam was something that was acquired, whereas the other was a gift. So wasn't it? Didn't it say that? They're saying, seem yeah. to be saying two, two or three different things. Yeah, I know. Well, I would imagine it's acquired in the sense that when you're inhabiting it, hmm. you invest yourself in it and it becomes yours, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Even though when it first dawns upon you, it's something unexpected that you didn't create. Uh, I would guess. I was something thinking like more that. of something kind of was rewarded, like you strove for. Uh -huh. The state, no, the other one. The macabre. Well, I suppose you could labor in that state, mm -hmm. and it, become, it requires a permanency. 
as the place where you are or something. I thought of it as a, you know, when Barbara first awakens us and then it's like up to us if we continue to pursue yeah. it. Or Don't not, be like or a not it's still a choice and then you, you, you pursue it. Yeah, that's probably a good analogy for it or a good piece mm. of it. There's an awakening, something that comes over you, but then you have to yeah, make like it permanent. Yeah, effort and grace, isn't it? One's yeah. the grace and one's the effort. Yeah. I suppose. Has anybody actually gone into the plains and um, But this is creating a vocabulary for talking about inner mm -hmm. states. I can sort yes. of yeah. relate to this. And like you said before, if that can be, like the English language has always absorbed words from other uh, cultures and that, so they wouldn't be doing anything different. They could just absorb those words because... Like these are two words that we've got to have. Yeah. There's no English word that um, does justice to these ideas. No. Do you remember when 2001 came out many, many years ago? A lot of Bible lovers were really, really impressed that the computer's name was Hal. That's right. No, no, that's that's all right. Oh. How about that? Eh? <laughs> but this next paragraph describes a little bit more. Um, I'll just read it. We yeah. have so far defined the most important terms <coughs> that are used in describing the various planes and their experiences, and we shall now discuss each plane and its particular experiences in further detail. It should be understood that these descriptions of the various planes have been given by Man Baba. Uh. The first plane, the funner uh, and the first plane, the, the funner of the first plane. The first stage of the path is, is when we begin gradually to experience with full consciousness the subtle sphere. The soul, through the media of the mind and the subtle organs, experiences the subtle, experiences the subtle sphere. Uh, like the man on the gross sphere experiencing through the media of the mind and the, the gross organs, the gross sphere. The first plane is nearer to the gross than the subtle plane. Someone else want to have a read? Okay, I'll read some more, I don't mind. Can we read somewhere where if anyone on each plane is like wobbly for a while? We don't read that sometimes. Even we just word, touched on it before. No, no, it's one of these other ones that we've read. Actually, I'm sure it used the word wobbly. Right, no, I haven't heard that word. Wobbly? Yeah. 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 I suppose if they're intoxicated, they're, mm. you know, <laughs> yeah, in balance. Oh, you know what I mean. Yeah. Mm. Mm. But when you went on each one, it took like you a while to adjust. Can't get it together. Yeah. Mm. Mm. yeah, I remember that then. The traveler on the first plane hears the subtle music sound distinctly, smells the subtle scent acutely, sees the dazzling flashes of the subtle light in steady circles, and if he has been put on the path by a master or guide, he sees the master's figure in its true spiritual splendor in these circles of light. I've read this somewhere where Baba said this. Mm. Now Duncan says, Gunny, about these experiences, those described in this paragraph are those of a traveler on the first plane. Page 22 of chapter 5 in this Chai script. He describes similar, though less acute experiences than the one who's about to enter the first plane. I suppose differences are intentional and that one is about, who is about to enter the first plane does have experiences of this concern. I wonder if Baba talked to Duncan a lot about this, you know, when Duncan was doing all that work with the musts and writing the wayfarers, Baba yeah. might have, you know, yeah. and, and, uh, <clears throat> and that's how Duncan could pick up Ghani on some points mm. that he never wrote down when Baba told him about the different uh, musts and stuff. I don't know. Yeah, I wonder. Because he seemed to have a lot of knowledge yeah. about it, didn't he? You know, yeah, it does. It does. Mm. Yeah. 
And those things he wrote in the uh, introductions to Wayfarers, yeah. they have a lot of technical knowledge yeah. and they're very detailed. So he got yeah. stuff from Bob, yeah. apparently. Yeah, I was wondering that too. Naturally, at this point, the pilgrim becomes absorbed in these novel experiences and is so taken with the musical sound, nod, and they use that in, when you take music lessons from a music teacher, they talk about the nod, actually. That he may lose gross consciousness completely for days together, just as in ordinary deep sleep, one becomes temporarily unconscious of all nukash e amal, or sanskaras, that's the term, the Islamic term kind of uses as the equivalent of sanskaras, and also of all ego and mind, the pilgrim too, although fully conscious of the subtle experiences, loses all consciousness of the existence of his lower self for the time being. Hmm. If Johnny might do some reading. Don't just come. Oh, good. I like. I'm going to put that thing away. He wasn't going to drop it until we got onto the first one. That's right. Yeah, yeah we made you, John. That's yeah. right. Oh. Yeah. He just dropped into the first plane. He dropped into it. Oh. We had a very interesting analogy of the train station and the waiting room mm -hmm. and the Rest guest here. house and sightseeing. Sightseeing. This is all prior to the first plane. Mm -hmm. um, that was a description of. He used the railway station as a uh, uh, as the plane, mm -hmm. the waiting room as the um, samadhi, in that. And the rest house. If you go into it and go to sleep, there used to be rest houses, I guess outside the station, not the same thing as a waiting room, yeah. to go to sleep, and that would be like fana. And when Baka is when you wake up in the rest house and look out the windows and see oh. this outside side, that's mm -hmm. like Baka. Right. And then you can go, go out to the guest house and explore the Baka. Yeah. yeah. And the people who go outside and explore the Baka and never come back are the gum sat, I forget, gum something or other, and he translates lost ones. And he says they're mistakenly taken to be saints, but their Hafez warns us about this, and then he breaks off, and we've lost the rest of that section. So it's quite interesting. I've never seen... It was, it was saying something about 99% of them actually come back and, and, yeah. and go on, and 1% of the ones get lost. Get lost. Oh, okay. They don't have to get lost in the town. No, no. And some who go to sleep in the guest house in Fana never wake up. And then in the it next might lifetime... be the fourth plane ones that slip. But that, I don't think it means they slip, because in their, in their next lifetime, they find themselves back at the station yeah. again. Yeah, when they wake mm -hmm. up. Wake the guest up. house, this rest house he calls the manzil, mm -hmm. which is distinct from the railway station. Mm -hmm. so anyway, it's quite... I don't know where Gandhi mm -hmm. got this rest. analogy. Station, rest house, guest house. Waiting room. The, the rest house, no guest house, rest house. Oh, rest house. Hotel. Waiting room. In town. In town. Rest house, where if you go to sleep in the rest house, it's phenomenal. When you wake and look out the windows, it's a yeah. cop. And he never talks about musts or people who go outside and get lost out there, the sun, whatever it is. Is that a must or is that something different? Mm. But it's on the train journey. Yeah. At, at, they stop at the station and they yeah. do this and that. And when you stop at the station, he said, when you go into a new plane, it's natural for your mental activity to be really, really slowed down because you can't, it takes a while to adjust mm -hmm. to before you can actually function there. So, I don't know, so that's... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we all concurred that it that, that is like that. Yeah. yeah. As best we can recall. <laughs> yeah, like we're all, all, all the saints. I'll take the consensus. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> yes. We're, we're the authority. Right. That's right. <laughs> ha, ha. Lived experience. It's my excuse and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> okay, I'll read you in a paragraph. Um, so he's just talked about, first,
first plane, how you lose consciousness of the lower, of the ego, etc., etc., um, for the time being. And what does this temporary annihilation of the lower self amount to? It is fana. Okay, so here's another definition of fana. If not the complete annihilation that we have defined before, see page blank, the total and permanent, I guess, end, annihilation of all sanskaras and of the ego and the mind is the seventh or the final fana. Now Duncan says, you put in of the ego and of the mind after some scares, was this really necessary? As we proceed, we shall find that there are in all seven fanas corresponding to the seven planes. In other words, besides the final fana of the seven plane, there are six preparatory fanas annihilations of the lower self, which a pilgrim has to go through. Similarly, the final abiding with God state, the Baka of the seventh plane, is only gained when the six minor states of Baka and the corresponding planes have been achieved. You can see why there's no going back, because if, if where you've been gets annihilated, you've got nowhere to go, you've got to keep going right. forward. That's true, it's actually yeah. annihilated. And then, I don't know where this is supposed to go, it should be noted that those, that there is distinction between the experiences of one who is about to enter the first plane and of one who is actually on the first plane. The experience of the former, experiences of the former are described briefly on page, chapter something on page 22. Okay, I guess that's responding to Ghani's, to Duncan's criticism. So I wonder what actually gets annihilated, because if uh, the mind is slowed down uh, after the annihilation, and then having gotten used to that plane, yeah. you turn it and you become able to interact, interface with the world again. Yeah. Then there's obviously something that hasn't been annihilated. Gross consciousness? Yeah. I know in some of the notes yeah. Francis took in the 60s, it's not a blank slip. Yeah, he says, he talks about not these fanas of the planes, but when you go from gross consciousness to subtle consciousness, and subtle to mental. And this is taking notes from Baba, I think. He said that when the gross consciousness is thinned out, gross sanskaras are thinned out, all of a sudden the subtle sanskaras come into view. Yeah. I remember that. Remembering yeah. and writing that, yeah. So it could be that it's a new kind of sanskara that you couldn't see before. Mm. That would be a... Well, yeah. Oh. Or is it the same sense covered a view from a different point of view, so it has a different quality? Yeah. Yeah. So the original nature persists. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the lower aspect to it has been kind of hacked off, but the Sanskara remains in its higher Redeem, parts, deeper parts. Mm. Yes. Yeah. It, it'd be a bit like oh. that. It just takes over naturally at that time, didn't it? Or something like when that. the sanskaras come up, yeah. they, said it, they just come into view naturally. Mm. Yeah. Mm. It, it'd be to me, it'd be a bit like awareness in the gross plane, where as you develop, you then become conscious of more stuff and you actually become aware of your surroundings more. You know how when you first start out you're sort of just doing your own thing and you're not really seeing anything, you're just, you're just seeing what you want ahead. But as you develop, your, your view 
field of view gets wider and wider and wider and you become aware of more and more and more. Mm. It seems like it's a bit like that, you know. You're on the first plane as you're coming up. Uh, uh, you're, you're on the gross plane, you're coming up to the subtle plane mm. and your field of view is getting wider and, and they sort of come into view and you become aware of them. What do you think it means by first plane sanskaras coming to view? Yeah. Well, I suppose one way of reading it is that there are different kinds of sanskaras, there are different aspects of the old sanskaras, maybe, mm. that you couldn't experience before you were there. Mm. I could well believe that because the first plane you see things you just didn't see before. Mm. So there would have to be a kind of sanskara that would make such an experience possible, I should think. I don't know that. This is all news to me. Awesome. Yeah. All right, tell me. Yeah. Well, he goes on. What is this temporary? Oh, no, we read this already, didn't we? Did we read this? Yeah. 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 Well, did you feel like reading, John? Sure. Yeah. We had our fun up, so now we can oh, go back up. Oh, let's, let's, let's go explore. Let's have some fun over back up. When the uh, pilgrim becomes absorbed in the experiences of the first plane, he achieves the lowest fana. Just as a normal man wakes up automatically from sound sleep, so also one who is absorbed in the lowest fana becomes conscious after some time and achieves a settled position in the first plane. In other words, he gains the baka of the first plane. The pilgrim is now, in a is now in a position to read the minds of persons near him, and he can see any part of the gross world, irrespective of its distance, without going there physically, say, it's got a Google map. Mm -hmm. yeah. Suppose that the person who has achieved the first bakka is in Africa and he wishes to see the North Pole, uh, the, the summit. summit of Mount Everest, or the nether point of the Swire Deep. Deep. Of the, of the white deep. Yeah. Swipe, is, it, is that the swipe? Of the deep, anyway, yeah. yeah. The deepest part of the deep, yeah. Um, I should, without moving his body with the same clearness and certainty as uh, an ordinary explorer, supposing he could reach these places by physical means, would then, with his, uh, with them, with his gross eyes, or anyway. Would see them with his gross eyes. Yeah, yes. But only limited uh, and particular areas can thus be seen by the pilgrim, and not whole countries or continents. Hafiz evidently refers to the first plane when he says, it is not known where the real abode of the divine beloved is. Only this much is clear that I hear the sound of bells from the travelling caravans. Now that gets quoted in the supplement to God Speaks, mm. but the rest of this hasn't been. It will be seen that Hafiz speaks of sound, like the ringing of bells when a caravan is marching, as characteristic of the first plane of the spiritual journey. What he really means is that sound, or celestial music, is, predominant, is the predominant characteristic of the first plane, though the features of sight and sweet smell 
are also present throughout the set of planes along with sound. On this subject, on the subject sound and the plane, on the subject of sound and planes, is it on the back or is it on the next page? Huh. Uh, yeah, I don't, don't see it. Oh, maybe the sentence just is going on. On yeah. the subject of sound in the planes. Uh, we quite, uh, my brother says. However, know this, that sound obtains throughout all the seven planes, differing in its expression of feeling, ecstasy, and bliss. The sound, sight, or smell of the higher planes can, with no stretch of the imagination, be likened to what we are used to on the physical plane. Our physical organs of hearing, seeing, and smelling are useless for experiencing or enjoying the higher planes. Therein, it is a different eye that sees, a different ear that hears, a different nose that smells. We know already that there are inner senses, a counterpart of the external senses in man, and it is the former that experience the higher planes. Avoiding the mistake of likening the sound of the higher planes to something different in intensity, intensity of frequency of vibration to the sound of the physical plane, know it no, it is for a certainty that there is actually there is actually what may be called sound in the first three planes. The form, beauty, music, and bliss of this sound are beyond description. The nub or celestial music sound is particular to the first plane, which happens refers to as Banje Jaras. The meaning of bells. As stated above, although there is sound in all the seven planes, it is smell that is particular to the second and to the third planes, and sight belongs to the fifth and sixth planes. You know, it is in the, that chapter in God Speaks on the Sevenfold Veil, Baba does say that when you go to the first plane you pass in through the mouth. And when you go to the second and third planes, you pass in through the right and the left nostrils. Mm -hmm. I don't know why that would make sound particular to the first plane, but the second and third scent smell makes sense. Oh, the sound comes mm -hmm. out. That could be. And he said that going to the Fourth plane is a two and one achievement through the right and left ears. Hmm. And going to the fifth plane is a two and one achievement through the right and left eyes. So on the fifth plane, uh, you're going in through both of your eyes. Hmm. And you're going up, aren't you? Yeah. yeah. Whatever all that means. He, he oh. talks about it, but doesn't explain it really. But it would seem to have something to do with those subtle, those inner senses mm. associated with those organs. So what are we up to in the fourth plane? Yes. Uh, the bliss of the sound, smell, and sight are all overshadowed, overshadowed by mm. Gandhi's handwriting is that? Oh. 
Donnie's handwriting, I'm not good at recognizing handwriting, but his does seem a bit neater than Donnie's. So yeah, something about the pound. Yes. Because it's an L-Y. For this reason, that a wayfarer, traversing the path alone, unaided by a master, finds himself benighted and forlorn in the fourth plane, is very strongly tempted to make wrong use of his psychic powers, of which the three lower planes, which uh, culminate in the fourth, uh, as cid cities, as cities, yeah. Kash Karamat, huh? Kash is, I think, a revelation or something. Karamat, I think, is just powers. Hmm. You can now clearly see, see the incomparable, dazzling. Subtle light in innumerable circles, but uh, this subtle light, dazzling as it is, is not the real divine light in the sense and, and of the Sufi term, Nur. I don't know what plane that was on. Seventh plane stands unique. The sound, sight, and smell here are divine in essence and have no comparison to these, those emanating from the lower planes. In this plane, one does not hear, smell, or feel, but becomes sound, smell, and sight mm. uh, simultaneously and in a divinely conscious of it. I notice we're down to three senses, and I think God speaks as something like that too, that in the, from the subtle world on there are only three senses left. Mm. So I guess taste and touch are, are they just gross? Plain gross senses? The different uh, religious practices of the yogas, after establishing contact with the highest, the higher planes, induce experiences particular to those planes. For instance, contact with the first plane, sound, engenders lower inspiration. Contact with the second and third planes, sound and smell, engenders inspiration and higher inspiration. Or intuition. Or oh, intuition. Oh, yeah, higher intuition. Contact with the fourth plane, with the sound and smell. Uh, what's that? Overshadowed. Overshadowed by almighty power, cities, engenders insight and contact with the fifth and sixth plane, where one feels and sees God everywhere and in everything, engenders illumination. And this experience of the fifth and sixth is called Marafat Gnosis by the Sufis. The seventh plane stands for realization, which according to the Sufis is Hakikat reality. Well that's you know, we hear so much talk about intuition and all those things. So this is uh, you know an interesting account. First plane is lower inspiration. Second is intuition, third is higher inspiration, fourth is insight, fifth and sixth is illumination. Just giving some technical precision to those words. I have a question. Hmm. Where did the Sufis get that knowledge from? I guess it would be a question of which Sufis he's talking about he's quoting. I mean, there were some perfect masters among them, but 
who gave this particular information? I don't know. Mm -hmm. But uh, hakikat, that's kind of a standard Sufi term for, like when uh, Mansur al Halad said Anil Haq, that was heretical because Haq meant God. It literally means truth, but it's understood to mean God. So Hakikat would be the state of the seventh plane, which is the state of the reality. So that would be pretty universally understood in Sufism. The seven planes. And Not the seventh plane, they wouldn't call it, but that Haq means God. Truth with the capital T. Okay, yeah. Without meaning God realization. Well, they wouldn't, um, Orthodox Islam would not admit the possibility of God realization. No. Mm -hmm. So when somebody like Mansur al Halaj said, I am God, he was in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> the. Uh, Second plane, the father of the second plane. When the pilgrim reaches the second plane, his subtle organs, of course, become very keen and active. He can now clearly see the incomparable, dazzling, subtle light, the innumerable circles. Although this subtle light, dazzling as it is, is not the real divine light sense of the Sufi term Nuru. Moreover, the subtle organs are now capable of conveying subjective experiences to the pilgrim in the shape of feeling. Consequently, besides seeing the subtle light, uh, the pilgrim begins to feel the light. And this feeling of the light produces such a thrilling ecstasy in him as to overpower him completely, so that he becomes totally unconscious of everything else, including his lower self, for days and days together. Is this fana? We sort of talked about it then. This would be the fana of the second plane. Yeah, I guess. It sounds like it. Any of you remember? <laughs> I wish. The Baka of the second plane. The resultant Baka of this father of the second plane is intuition. This is not to be interpreted in the ordinary sense of the word. There is as much difference between the subtle faculty of intuition world the inspiration of the poet, painter, artist, scientist, and philosopher, as that between the faculty of understanding in a man and in an animal. Mm. Uh. One of the commoner results of this inspiration is the pilgrim can read the minds of spiritually ordinary persons who may be at the time, uh, who may at the time be anywhere physical world. Suppose one who has achieved a position in the second plane, second minor baka, is in China. He will not only be able to read from there the mind of any spiritually ordinary human being in Europe or America, but also in any other existing inhabited gross world. And it is as easy and natural for him to read the minds of others as it is for an ordinary man to know his own thoughts. Mm. Hafiz evidently refers to this play when he says, How should I reveal to you that last night in the town, intoxicated and unsteady as I was, that good tidings were brought to me by the angels? And it said spiritually ordinary people, not just ordinary people. Yeah. Yeah. Now that couplet of Hafez, once again, in the supplement that God speaks, I don't think most of it, that 
just there with that couple of dudes. In the third plane, the sign seeing the subtle light everywhere as one whole, the pilgrim feels that he is himself transmuted into this wonderfully dazzling light. He finds it enveloping him from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet. In the second plane, the pilgrim begins to feel the light, but here, in the third plane, he can at times actually, but subtly, touch this subtle light. This results in so great and serene an ecstasy that the pilgrim loses his gross consciousness completely and for days together. Ah. Sounds pretty good. Yeah, let's go there. Let's go there. <laughs> The backer of the, they don't mention the bad, the bad side. That's <laughs> <all right. laughs> Just the, the nice things. Yeah, yeah. The backer of this the is third. advertisement copy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Come to the third plane. <laughs> the backer of the third plane. Following this third fana, the pilgrim attains the third minor backer. Gunny, Gunny! On the previous page, you said that the second and third planes engendered intuition, and that the seventh plane stands for revelation. Now here, you say that the pilgrim acquires revelation in the bucket of the third plane. What does he acquire? Do you think that the musts going through the planes had a nag chasing after them? <laughs> <laughs> Scolding them like this. <laughs> All secrets in the gross and the subtle worlds are now revealed to him. The pilgrim of the third plane is now in a position to read not only the mind of any person in the gross sphere, but also that of any person in the subtle sphere. That Baba, more or less, delegates these abilities to the mental plane, doesn't it? Well, I've read where he says these things too, but it is kind of surprising mm -hmm. that you can read minds I mean, yeah. just in the lower planes. But I've read where he said this. Well, maybe thing. ordinary, uh, yeah, because you're not a master of the mind. Yeah. Really yeah. Could get very confusing. Yeah. Reading everyone's mind. I know. Make you feel yeah, a bit mad. You probably go around saying, Shut up! <laughs> <laughs> you fucking to me? <laughs> Arthur refers to this plane in the following words What perturbation and distress this musician with, with knowledge of spiritual states and stages is causing the listeners' lungs. By interpolating in the midst of the performance the words of the divine. Mm -hmm. Intermediate between, intermediate between the third and fourth plane. The journey between the third and fourth plane is at once difficult, dangerous, and dangerous because almost halfway between these two planes there is the point of enchantment. Ah, oh, Francis got that. Yeah. Grab that one. Yeah. Um, Makam. Yeah, I that. This is very difficult. Uh, pass out of this dazed state if the pilgrim once steps there, stops there. Although most pilgrims pass directly from the third to the fourth plane. Unless the pilgrim gets out of this state quickly and proceeds onwards to the fourth plane, his progress will come to an end here. Once a pilgrim becomes thus enchanted, he remains so for days, months, or years together. He can neither make further progress nor can he retrogress. He is neither gross conscious nor subtle conscious. At the same time, however, he cannot be called unconscious because he is fully conscious of the enchantment. Uh, 
uh, it is because of this consciousness of the enchantment that he lives, he, he lives this living death. The physical condition of the enchanted pilgrim is no less strange, for if he eats himself, seats himself, seats himself. Seats himself in a particular position, he remains in that position for months or years together. Similarly, if he becomes deeply enchanted while standing, he will continue standing until the enchantment ends. In short, he remains stationary in the position in which he first became enchanted. And though he may appear a lifeless statue, he is in fact more alive than the ordinary man of the world. It is well known to the Sufi world now how um, Ali Ahmed Sabir of uh, Piran, Kanya, who afterwards became a perfect master, once remained standing for years near a certain tree. During this period, Shabir's mind was absorbed in the enchantment of this Mukam i Hiryat. And he was delivered from it by Kutu. Only natural death or divine help from the living master can help such a dazed pilgrim out of his spiritual stalemate. A master who would help such a pilgrim either by bringing him back to the third plane or pushing him onwards. Hafez no doubt thinks of this stage of the pilgrim, of the pilgrim when he says, make me so dazed and intoxicated that on account of this state of forgetfulness I should be oblivious to what I was struck that this guy was, uh, Sabir was caught in the, this hierarchy between the third and fourth plane, but in the same lifetime became a perfect master. Yeah. It seems like covering a lot of ground. Sure. Yeah. I would have thought it'd take a long time to just go through the fourth plane or go through the fifth plane. Yeah. Perhaps he had an unresolved block back there, but he'd done everything else. Worked, he'd worked it all out in that night. Mm -hmm. Where are Barbara on the uh, Makram? Yeah. Hida. Right there. Right there. The same thing. Yeah. Where Barbara explains that the Pilgrim meets the Makram, Makram, the Hida. 99% in between the third and fourth planes. Mukam Ihariat has two phases, two planes, or plana phases, strong and feeble. Yeah. If there is no hitch or disturbing factor for the pilgrim at the time of becoming enchanted, then the Hariat confronted is very strong and complete. And if there, is, if there be any disturbing factor present at the time, then the Hariat is partial and feeble. If a pilgrim, a pilgrim experiencing strong or feeble, Mukam i Hariat, from between the third and fourth planes, uh, if by accident is pushed forward to a higher plane, then he invariably goes to between the fifth and sixth plane with the same strong or feeble honey. Huh. Such uh, instances are very rare. Uh, like that of uh, Ali Ahmed Sabir uh, of the um, uh, Kalya, uh, Kalya and Baba Abu Rah, uh, Rahman, Rah, Rahman of uh, Bombay, who both experienced a very strong type 
more common than the other ones, between the fifth and the sixth class. Now, I'm not sure about it, but I think they might be fairly modern people. Maybe even must Subaba contacted or of the period just before that. I'm forgetting where I had that idea. They might be modern things. A complete fixity of plane. Posture. A posture that lasts until death. Or it Perfect master. Or until. In, until or until death, a or perfect until. master is contacted, is seen only in these pilgrims who have what Mabaka calls a very strong mukam i hanya. That is to say, a very strong and powerful enchantment. Ah. Muhammad, the master, got intoxicated who has been with Baba for so many years, was in this state of Mukami Hanya when he was first brought to Rahuri in 1936. In the case of Muhammad, the Mukami Hanya was feeble, and although he would stand for many hours at a stretch in one position, uh, this would not be maintained permanently. The enchantment of Muhammad, uh, of uh, Ali uh, Ahmed uh, Sabir, however, was a strong one, and he remained in one posture until he was delivered from the enchantment by the Kutu. Uh, what stage is that? This. Oh, this state of enchantment, incidentally, should not be confused with the catatonic stupor of uh, schizophrenics. Schizophrenics, although it uh, admittedly appears to be similar, both are states of enchantment, but they are poles apart. Gani, according to Baba Muhammad, or Muhammad, when he first came to Baba, was between the third and fourth plane, and was in this Gani uh, area. Uh, you might like to mention this here, perhaps as an example, which would be of interest to Baba's disciples. Oh, but he has. Oh. Another point also is that from the way you've described the behavior of the pilgrim in Gani area, it seems that in whatever physical position he went into the state, he remains in it literally until he dies or until he meets the perfect master. But is this literally true? Muhammad used to, yeah, so he's actually yeah, he's taken that into account. Yeah, it's character. been rewritten. Yeah. yeah. What else? Fourth plane? Trying to work the fourth plane? When it reaches the fourth plane, which is between the subtle and mental spheres, uh, gets all the uh, different subtle experiences of the first three planes at one and the same time. Good. Else, Gunny, all elsewhere you have told us that the fourth plane is between the subtle and the mental spheres. Here you say it is the last and highest subtle plane. Sorry to be pedantic, but why not be clear? So Baba allows us to do things to be uh, yeah. yeah. I've seen this many times described both ways. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. They, they don't really contradict each other. And so yeah. the pedantic uh, apologizing. Duncan suggests that it is not therefore surprising that as a result of these combined experiences, the pilgrim passes through the fourth lower fauna, which lasts sometimes for months and years together. The baka of the fourth plane. When the pilgrim subsequently acquires the fourth baka, 
you fools from the frying pan into fire. <laughs> he now acquires a number of psychic and miraculous powers that invite his undoing. Because he has not yet eliminated all desires, and so cannot help using these powers indiscriminately. It is for this reason that the fourth plane is considered the greatest and most dangerous stumbling block of the spiritual power. Mm -hmm. The powers that are acquired after the fourth fire enable the pilgrim to raise the dead to life. So you have to come back out of the fauna before those powers come to you, apparently. Mm. Well, that makes sense, because then you start to function. Yeah, you're not really functioning when you're mm. s stoned out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Force stoned out, force play. <laughs> <laughs> and since, in spite of the intuition, ins inspiration, whatever, revelation, you, you must get this well, Danny, you must get this revelation business straight. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, awaken the cities. Uh, he still possesses some desires. He simply cannot resist the temptation to exercise these powers. For those on the path, these powers are like the devil who is popularly believed to lead people astray. When it is said that Mara tempted Buddha, uh, uh, Rupa, Haraman, yeah. tempted Zoroastra, and Satan tempted Jesus, the reference is to these very powers which these prophets were tempted to exercise when they were on the fourth plane, but did not do so. But the timely help of uh, Yanashwa, the Sadhguru, Changdeva, the great yogi, would have come to grief on this very plain. It's a story of him riding up on a tiger. tiger. Yeah. Meeting Yanashwa on top of the wall. Yeah. And Yanashwa said, well, we have to go greet him properly. And the whole wall walked forward to greet him on the tiger. Similarly, when uh, Baba Farid uh, Ganji Shankar reached this stage, he could not help testing his powers by making birds on the wing fall down dead and raising them to life again. However, he too was saved in time by an aged woman who was a saint of the fifth plane. It was after this incident, incident that Baba Farid came into close contact with his master who finally led him to Kutubiat, a perfect masterhood. Yeah, no, so here's another guy who goes all the way from the fourth plane to perfect masterhood in one lifetime. I guess if you get a Sadhguru, you can just zip through the planes, huh? Yeah, Baba talks about if you don't use the powers, you can Skip, go to the, the, skip the fifth and go to the sixth. Uh, if you don't use them, you go to the fifth. Fifth, uh, if you do use them, them well, oh, well, ah, go yeah, to the yeah. sixth. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what's this note on the side here? Since fifth from fourth. fourth plane, the pilgrim either progresses to, to absolute safety or goes down to the very beginning of the stone fall. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. The fourth plane is as important as it is dangerous. And then we just read again. Again, you must make it clear whether the fourth plane is part of the subtle sphere or whether it lies between the subtle and the sphere. After the end of the fourth stage of the journey, the traveler passes into the mental sphere, which comprises the fifth and sixth planes. Once he has experienced the first four planes, the pilgrim, which constitutes the subtle sphere, he starts to there, 
the pilgrim may appear to others to be either normally conscious uh, of the physical world or to be even completely unconscious of it. But he is nevertheless at all times fully conscious of the subtle sphere. There is no doubt in his mind about the subtle experiences. Kawaja Hafez visualizes the dangers inherent in this plane, plane when he says, On the threshold of the beloved, beware of the allurements of the heavens, lest you bring about your fall from the heights of progress and greatness to the depths of degradation and ruin. Here, Kawaja clearly refers to the temptations of succumbing to the lures of using supernatural powers, for cities, for self-aggrandizement and material benefits. By indulging in these powers, the pilgrim invariably falls to the lowest phase right? uh, of evolution, the state of stone state, helped forward by a perfect master, unless helped forward by a perfect master. Yani, here by saying that he falls to the last one of evolutionary matter, I presume you mean that he goes to stone state. Why not say so? Also, Yanni, you, you are, I think, misusing the ladder metaphor. When you fall off a ladder, you fall off altogether. <laughs> you can't really fall to a lower or a lowest run. <laughs> you can climb from the lowest to the highest, but if you fall, you fall off. The sphere of safety from which there is no falling back, the fifth plane, the final of the fifth plane. Well, when the pilgrim reaches the fifth plane, he enters the mental sphere. He now masters the mind and can work through the mind without using the gross, uh, gross or subtle organs. Thus, he can produce results of the mental, subtle, and gross spheres with far greater precision than those who use the gross or subtle organs. Until the mental sphere is reached, Nobody can know what the mind actually is. Ah, so that's what becoming the master of the mind is. Yeah. Ordinary human beings can use their minds to a certain extent because it is impossible to do anything in the gross or subtle spheres without first doing that thing in the mind, consciously or unconsciously. If the pilgrim of the mental sphere is in, in India and conceives the idea of seeing America, he has not even to think about going to America because simultaneously with the wish on his part, he will be there. One may ask how he travels as fast as thought itself. And the answer is that because the mind is everywhere, the pilgrim of the mental Fear does not, does not, strictly speaking, travel. He can be anywhere he likes without using his gross or subtle organs. If while in India you, as an ordinary man, think that you are in America, you may feel yourself to be there to a certain extent, but you would not feel it as fully as if you were bodily present there. The ordinary person can only experience in his imagination gross actions like walking, eating, and drinking because in the gross sphere he uses the mind through the gross organs. When he reaches the mental sphere, he can use the mind directly without the help of the gross or subtle organs and can directly produce tangible results. In the gross and subtle sphere, the soul works with full consciousness through the medium of the mind, plus the subtle and 
gross organs. In the mental sphere, the soul, without necessarily using the gross or subtle organs, can work with full consciousness. The mind does not actually think and need not because it acts directly, independently of the subtle and gross organs. Mm. On entering the fifth plane, the pilgrim comes... So it sounds like in the fifth plane you don't think in the ordinary yeah. sense anymore. You are that. You are that. Yeah. Huh. Maybe okay. that has something to do with lower plane people being able to read thoughts. This yeah. plane you're in a really a different order of yeah. dealing with the question. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you some marble thoughts about this. Yeah, you are the yeah. yeah. On entering the fifth plane, the pilgrim comes to have a direct connection with God because he actually feels the connection between his own existence and the existence of God. Maybe he's participating with God in creating the Yeah. Yeah. If you allow Baba to work through you. Yeah. If you connect it. In certain I think in Infinite Intelligence, Baba talks about uh, someone on the fifth plane as being like Ishwar, mm -hmm. great observer, destroyer of the universe. Mm -hmm. Something, sometimes this feeling of direct connect, connection with God overpowers him so much that he is drowned in it. And when this happens, he passes through the fifth lower fire which may last for hours or days together. From this, it may be seen that the fauna of the fifth plane is of a much shorter duration than the fauna of the lower planes. Mm. Mm. So here's something I'm wondering about this fauna and baka business. Mm. Um, is it cyclic and recurring? Or, I mean, do you go into fana, and then you come out into a baka of the plane, and then you go back into the fana, into the baka? Mm. Uh, or is so it a one time only deal? Uh, the analogy yeah. of the uh, going back to the, in Ghani's analogy, yeah. would suggest that you keep going back. Yeah. It's a cyclic thing. Yeah. But that was only in the analogy. It hasn't been really clearly one way or another. Because the Sufis have these. Expansive mood and they're, they're, they're retraction. Yeah, retraction. Are you talking within the same plane? Yeah. Oh. I would tend to think there would have to be a certain repetitiveness to it. But I don't know. It sounds, it, it sounds like there would be. Because, you know. Although, on the other hand, he said when you first come into a plane, you're a bit stunned. But it wasn't clear when he said that that, that was fana, hmm. that it was samadhi. I don't know if that's the same thing. He said, uh, sometimes it, this feeling overpowers and then when it happens, he goes into... So that sounds like a recurrent thing that happens from time to time. Mm -hmm. When the pilgrim gets the fifth minor baka, he becomes completely and permanently freed from all desires. His mind becomes utterly clean, and he is therefore now to a greater, to, to a greater extent safe. Gare, as clear <coughs> as crystal, not as pure as crystal, <laughs> such as, such, uh, so change pure. Or change crystal. <laughs> <laughs> Mixed metaphor. Uh, the reason why we do not attribute uh, unqualified safety to the Mali, uh, the pilgrim's position here, is that although his mind and thought are quite free, the ego is still there and will remain. Uh, until he reaches the yes, 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 right. yeah. Why bring the in Wally here? To someone who is not a Sufi, this sudden introduction 
of this new word without any explanation. It's most confusing. But uh, Barbara Godspeaks talks about it. Yeah. Well, the fifth plane. I'm, nowadays, I'm totally accustomed to the word. But in those days, it was still new vocabulary. The total annihilation of the lower self for good. Nowadays, yeah, the sixth plane is not like it used to be. Uh, <laughs> no. It really no. isn't. Is, is, um, is, um, I can't believe his name, is he typing it up? And as he's typing up the words, he's adding these little things in brackets, is that? Duncan. Duncan, is that, that what's seems happening? Like. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like. He's typing up from the written. Yeah, yeah. or he's sort of editing and copying over, and in the course of that, he throws in comments. Mm. It must be, there's no other way of explaining yeah. that that I can yeah. see. That is the final farmer which is the goal of the spiritual path, is only achieved when the pilgrim enters into the seventh plane. In spite of this imperfection, the pilgrim of the fifth plane is comparatively a great soul indeed. Dani. The last sentence of the preceding paragraph in the first sentence of this you mentioned losses. This seems irrelevant of this meaning here. So I've deleted the reference to it. We can know anything and everything about the gross, subtle, and mental spheres simply by willing to know. And more important still, we can help others from amongst the less advanced souls as well as from the initiated ordinary human beings. To come up to his own level of progress. When he wants to help anyone directly, the pilgrim of the fifth plane can lead an aspirant by the hand along the path. And when he does so, the aspirant himself also perceives internally the continual presence of the master of the mind, the Wali, and also feels himself being actually led by him along the path to perfection. Hafez in the following couplet evidently visualizes the particular sensation of one who is being led in this way. Oh, August Master, lead me by the hand because I am traversing the path on foot in a helpless way as compared to other companions who are riding along it. Generally, however, a Wali, Maha Purusha, helps an aspirant by merely gazing into his eyes, thereby tearing away the inner veil from the eye, the real eye within. And thus, after initiating the aspirant into the path, he leaves him to work out his own advancement, which depends on the aspirant's own exertion, determination, and intensity of life. The spiritual influence of the Wali through sight is known to the Sufis as Tawajo. Tawajo. You've got to make a move. I'll catch you later. Okay, you're only getting up to the fifth plane. Yeah. 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 That's enough now. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I was just thinking, so it sounds like a, a Wali will, some people they take by the hand continuously and others they just tear away a veil and kind of let them do it the rest on their own. So there are different degrees of guidance you get, I guess. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. What was the last little sentence that was written on that page before? Uh, Handwritten at the bottom. A pilgrim on the fifth plane is known by the Sufis as a Wali. Oh, okay, thank you. Mm. So Bar Barbara somewhere, I think in the Everything or Nothing talks about mm. the, the ear whispering guru. Yes. Mm. I think he's the fifth plane. He That's the fifth plane. Yeah. 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 That's somebody else who just with a look. Yeah. Do you think the sixth plane or? Do you think the ones that take it by the hand could be Jamali and the ones that tear the veil away could be Jalali? Yeah, Maybe. it could be. Yeah, so, sort of fits in, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
at uh, was it Sheikh Abu Faisal or somebody glanced at uh, yes at Abu Sayyid. Uh, Actually, that's that's what this is going to go into this oh, story right, right here. Oh, right. Uh, when Abu Sayyid uh, was asked the cause of his having attained such a degree of perfection, he answered, the cause was a look from Sheikh Abu Fazl. Fazl, Fazl. He was a, uh, I was a student of theology, and one day when I was walking along the bank of the stream, Sheikh Abu Faisal approached me from the opposite direction and looked at me out of the corner of his eye. From that day on to this, all my spiritual possessions are the result of that. Mm. Well, you were right on the one beam look. of money. Yeah, one look. <laughs> one look. One look. One <laughs> look. It sounds like, I think Abu Sayyid was a uh, Sadhguru. I think so. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Or I don't know, maybe I just had that impression. Yeah, no, I think there was a, there was a book. There was a book. Yeah. By Abu Sayyid, yeah. yeah. Francis, I know, talks yeah. about him. Yeah. Um, departure has absolutely no relation to the practice of hypnotism. By this spiritual influence through sight, a wali can instantaneously make inanimate things move and can even shatter them to bits. Should he remain continuously in a superconscious state, his gaze is dangerous. For if you were to look at the heart of a spiritually ordinary man, it would cease to beat, and that man would fall dead on the spot. Ah, oh, Gunny. Many changes in these last two sentences. And also, I think you ought to explain how a wally looks at a man's heart. He's a stickler for detail, isn't he? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, does, he's not very poetic. I don't think he gets the poetry. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. Does he literally see the heart? Oh, come on, don't be so concrete. Which is what you imply, or what? I think you ought to make this clear. Or, if he were to gaze at uh, a rock, it would be shattered to bits, divided into two halves, yeah, right, uh, as if shattered by an earthquake. Gunny, this again is being inaccurately inaccurate. No, inaccurately accurate? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, why two halves? So why a mountain? According to the usual definition, a mountain is any hill more than a thousand feet high. <laughs> I make these remarks because you may repel unsympathetic readers. Well, I know that she's going to attract the sympathetic ones. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but as a rule, such a wally lives with drooping eyes in a secluded place, far from human contact. That's interesting. So they cover their eyes, their eyes droop. So what level again was Dr. Duncan? Hmm? What level was he? Oh, he was at the literary level. <laughs> <laughs> He's at the pedantic level. Yes, yeah, pedantic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you may something or other. That mankind is far from his parents. Or that he has he is far from mankind's I think you mean the former, but you have said the latter. The wicked man. Father, surely this is no right of this kind. There is no right of this kind. Wally. Surely there is no wally of this kind. <laughs> the wally who is continually gross conscious. He imparts the Alanjo when he likes, when he likes, by deliberately gazing into the astral's eyes, while the latter is seated before him. But the Wally, who, is all, who always remains in a super conscious state, is more powerful than 
lift the veil from the inner eye of any man that can sight. They put him in a path. And it does not matter what the man is doing at the time. So yeah, Francis mentions that uh, Kareem Barber, is it? That, uh, yeah. Just uh, knock you off to the city plane, that's just right. Or, or uh, Pulawala. Was it? The flower. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because Baba had said that, mm -hmm. comparing him with uh, Aurobindo. Oh. Baba said that following Aurobindo's paths, it would take you ages and ages. You're both on the sixth plane. Yes. But Pulawala, whatever his name was, Flower Waller. Pulawala. Could knock you up with one slap. Yeah. So he was a much more powerful. Yeah. Practitioner of the sixth time. Yeah. <laughs> Aurobindo is the literary type. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, Tawaja of the Wali, who is sometimes completely gross conscious and sometimes completely super conscious uh, state, is worthy of notice. I mean, he mentioned something about outcome. An outcome of what? I have deleted this phrase. Please check. When such a Wally departs the Tawajo, he gets the aspirant to sit before him with closed eyes and then looks through his breast at his heart <laughs> huh. with the result that the aspirant at once feels as if the cup of his heart were overturned and he begins to perceive the subtle light of the subtle eyes. Gani, when you talk of looking at the heart, couldn't you say he looks with his inner eye? Or he looks with his inner sight? This will avoid misinterpretation. You know, I'm wondering, um, in the Sufi um, psychology, they use the word kalb for heart. Nafs is kind of the lower self, and kalb is the heart. Yes. And the ruh is spirit. So I wonder if Gandhi was thinking actually of kalb. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. And there might be Sufi, uh, yeah. you know. And, uh, and um, Duncan's a doctor, and he did pieces of all of Organs, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. yeah so that explains it. Mm. But you, when you keep hearing um, Duncan correcting um, Ghani, you just think, well, why didn't Ga Duncan just do it, you know? Well, Baba yeah. probably told him to do it. And I, 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 think, I think Duncan was trying to make the writing precise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, correct grammar. That's yeah, sort of and that there are the, the writing that are inconsistencies. And for the West as well, for the Western West. yeah. readers, yeah. Mm. I mean, I think Duncan could understand a lot of what Gandhi was saying, but was just trying to point out that the writing is going in multiple directions at the same time. He was trying to get. What was Gandhi's background? Was he Sufi or? Um, well, of course, he was a disciple of Baba's from the very beginning. But he was sort of a self-educated Sufi. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. He just took an interest in, I don't know, maybe whether he was involved in Sufi orders in Pune, maybe he was. He a Parsi? Uh, no, he was a Muslim. He was a Muslim. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. He was a childhood friend of Abbas in Pune. So I'm sure he got some kind of an education in the Quran, like any kid would. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he, he wouldn't have had um, a, any other mentors but prior to Baba. Mm. I don't, I never heard of anything like that. But he must have hopped into a few libraries. Yeah. I guess he just took an interest in it and mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe he went to some kind of meetings and heard talks or something I, I've never heard. This experience of seeing the subtle light overturned cup of his heart rem remains steady and constant through the aspirant's waking and sleeping states. 
This idea of an overturned cup, yeah, I've yeah, never yeah. heard of anything like uh, that before. I was just going to ask you about the yeah. Well, that was part of the, uh, the cup, right, the cup right. of the heart. What's the word to it? Overturning of it, huh? Uh, empty, I, mean, I suppose, because if you overturn right. it. Right. And then you get something else in its place, I suppose. Yeah. It's like a cup overflows. Yeah. Like that? Do you think that's what it means? Well, overturned, if turned, it, overflows. Well, if, it, if it turned it upside down, then if it yes, okay. everything is dumped out, mm -hmm. maybe what was there is dumped out, and somehow uh, you're flooded, a higher heart or something. Sometimes they'll use the word seer, S-I-R-R, -R, to refer to the higher secret, a higher heart. In the waiting state, he sees at one and the same time both the subtle light through the inner eye and the gross world through the gross eyes. Gani, <laughs> what you see was not obscure, was most obscure. What you said was most obscure. Is what I have said what you meant? I guess this is a revised sentence. Yeah. It is interesting to compare the sleep of a spiritually ordinary human being with that of the aspirant who has been initiated into the subtle sphere by a wally. Both, both are equally unconscious of the gross sphere, but while the former is particularly conscious of the subtle sphere, or is it partially? Partially. The latter is fully conscious of the subtle sphere. Half is talks of the experience of this plane when he says, the mirror of Alexander is like the cup of Jamsha, wherein peer deeply, so that you may be illumined as to the state of affairs in the kingdom of Darius. Huh. I've never heard of the mirror of Alexander before. Oh. I've heard of the cup of Jamsha. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder what that was. And he says, peer deeply so that you can see the king affairs in the kingdom of Darius. And Darius was the Persian emperor who Alexander attacked and defeated. Yeah. Now, Alexander went to some temples at some point. To an oh. oracle. So maybe the oracle had him looking into a mirror. Okay. That would make sense. Or The now mirror, he interprets. Uh, yeah. The mirror of Alexander is the heart which, like the legendary cup of Jamshed, will afford you knowledge and illumination into the working of the whole cosmos, the kingdom of Darius. Yeah. This is a stage of illumination or has you know, no? I've never seen that yeah, before. Divine presence. Peculiar to the fifth plane. Huh. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Barbara, Barbara explains that in the fifth plane, the pilgrim sometimes is persistent in having divine presence, and sometimes he attends to other duties also. In fact, so far as divine presence is concerned, the fifth plane, it is God that persists in being present, but it all depends on the pilgrim being present too. On the sixth plane, however, God and the pilgrim both persist in being present to each other, 100%. Hafez evidently refers to this experience when he says, oh Hafez, if you desire the divine presence, then do not allow yourself to be absent. Mm -hmm. Explaining further, Mabhava said, there on the fifth and sixth those, those, those on the fifth and sixth planes cannot see the powers of the fourth plane in full abundance and for all purposes. They use these persons only for spiritual progress of others. The fourth plane pilgrim uses the supernatural powers for anything 
Those of the fifth and sixth planes only use their powers to help others spiritually. They do this knowingly and in two ways. Either they look into the eyes of the pilgrim or they look through the breast into the heart yeah. with the mental powers concentrated in the eyes or the heart, heart of that pilgrim. Oh, so those are two different methods, looking into the eyes or looking through the heart. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, by, by zoom. Yes. Oh. I was going to say, is the heart still like, um, like the mind, part of the mind, as um, in uh, effort and grace? Was, as Darwin sure was saying. Yes, it's but in the mind, is he it says it's in the mind? seated in the mind. The heart is seated mm. in the mind. So it's reading the mind. I guess it depends. I guess I mean, Gandhi is just using the word heart, and who knows what he means, but it must mean something like that. Mm. Part of the mind. The feeling part of the mind. Mm. Well, how are you guys doing? It's almost five. How much more do we have yeah. on this? Oh, we just finished the papers. Sure. Well, both through the breast and into the into heart of the pilgrim. Yes. A bazoo practically never bothers about Tawajo. He just experiences being God. But if he should accidentally look into the eyes or through the breast into the heart that uh, of a man, well, that man would drop dead. <laughs> this is almost this is almost never happened. Perfect master, of course he is with everyone, uh, has no need to use Tawajo, except in very rare cases. A person, uh, a person who, who are not in his circle, and even then he does it in a natural way, through look, through touch. Well, with theirs, we'll get a bit more of this. So. Well, should we stop here? That's probably yeah, a bit dark. Very blinded. Thanks, John, for. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks, John. Thank you. <laughs> well, what's your pleasure? Do you want to go on with this next week, or has oh, this been enough for yeah. you? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. What about you? No, I certainly can. Mm -hmm. Now, I, three weeks ago, printed out several copies of all this stuff. Uh, it's kind of a nuisance to do that. Do we need it? Um, well, uh, no, I don't. It's not hard to read on the page. Yeah, they're very difficult to read. On yeah. the page? Yeah. Is